Uh, dear colleagues, dear participants, welcome. Uh, as you well know, each Thursday, uh, we are performing a Thursday webinar, webinar in the name of Professional Voice Society Turkey. And each Thursday, we have a well-known speaker from, from the field. Today, uh, I have a very uh, great guest, which is very important for me because I had the privilege to listen to her a few times and I was really impressed with her presentations. And although she had some uh, small health problems, uh, she didn't even hesitate for a second uh, to join and to be with us today. Uh, our special guest today is Professor Katrin Neumann. Uh, Professor Neumann is both an otolaryngologist and a phoniatrician and pedodiologist. And she is the director of the Department of Phoniatrics and Pediatric Audiology in University Hospital Münster, Germany. And she is a member of uh, the World Health Organization Expert Advisory Board uh, to the work of WHO Program of Prevention of Deafness and Hearing Loss. And she is the WHO Officer of Union of European Phoniatricians and German, so German Society of Phoniatrics and Pediatric Audiology and German Society of Audiology. She is the former chair of Audiology Committee of the International Association of Logopedics and Phoniatrics and the Technology Committee of the Coalition for Glo Global Hearing Health. She is the associate editor to the Journal of Fluency and Fluency Disorders and Communication Disorders. She has a number of international and national awards. One of the, one of the most important ones is the European Phoniatrics Hearing Award for 2014. She has more than 240 original articles, uh, review articles, medical guidelines, and book chapters. She has a, a spectrum of research focus beginning from uh, hearing to professional voice to speech and language disorders, uh, including the whole uh, set of uh, phoniatric sub, uh, subspecialties. So I'm very happy to have uh, Professor uh, Katrin Neumann, dear Katrin, with us. So I will leave the stage to her. Uh, we will have a presentation of nearly one hour. I will be very pleased to have your questions during the speech so that I can gather them and we will try to discuss all of them at the end of the session. Katrin, uh, thank you very much for being with us. The stage is yours. Dear Harun, I thank you so much for this nice introduction. I did not recognize myself, uh, but <laughs> um, it's me just, uh, and I, I'm uh, feeling honored to give you this presentation, to be invited by you to speak about speech fluency disorders. Um, it's a, a wonderful issue because it's so interesting to see what happens, for example, in the brain, uh, in the brains of people who stutter, who clutter, and um, our complete understanding uh, of cluttering and stuttering has been re revolutionized during the past years. And, and I'm glad to share some evidence-based knowledge, knowledge with you about that. So at first I need to show you my screen. Can you see it? Yes, very well. Wonderful. Okay, then let's start and ask you questions. If you have some, uh, it's good to discuss it uh, at the moment where the questions arise. Um, why did we need a guideline on uh, speech fluency disorders in Germany? Um, yeah, because the prevalence of stuttering is high enough. Uh, we have a prevalence of 1.4 percent of uh, stuttering in children and of 0 0.8 in female uh, in males and 0 0.2 in females that is quite a lot so it's worth to deal with this uh, condition in order to properly identify diagnose and treat those, uh, those disorders we wanted to have a German guideline with the best evidence which will be available. And this evidence based on a specially uh, performed 
a systematic review for this guideline. And we have published it in 2016 and will redo uh, re, uh, it, overdo it in 2021, next year. It was necessary to review the current knowledge on fluency disorders because it has cha changed during the past years, in particular with respect to the causes of stuttering. Always it has been written, the cause of stuttering is unknown, but this is not the truth any longer. We know about this, the causes of stuttering. And we know about its neurostructural and neurophysiological underpinnings. Furthermore, a study of my group, uh, which we had performed before, showed that only two treatments of stuttering in Germany were effective and three treatment kinds of treatments were not. And unfortunately, one of them was the most applied um, um, uh, treatment. It was the usually given treatment given by logopedists, uh, speech language pathologists to the children once a week, intensive um, treatment without uh, yeah, recognizable concept. And uh, this has been applied in an age of the children when a, a cure is still very well possible. And if this time is missed, it is much more difficult to completely cure stuttering. And so we wanted to have a better, um, yeah, better uh, basis for stuttering treatments. This was our, our motivation. And patients have the right to receive the treatment with the best evidence. Hence, the therapists and uh, uh, physicians need to know and apply these treatments. Okay, so you can get this uh, guideline in a short form. Uh, it has been uh, published and is freely available. In the, uh, uh, yeah, you can uh, search it in the, in the internet or, the, or in PubMed and can download it. If you want, I can share this presentation with you if there is, a, is an opportunity. And so you can get this. Is this possible, Haldun? Sure. You can send you can send it to all, all our participants, Katrin. Okay, good. So uh, to classify speech fluency disorders, we have stuttering and we have cluttering. And uh, so far, people always talked about idiopathic stuttering, idiopathic. That means we do not know the cause of stuttering, but we renamed uh, this kind of stuttering and we um, uh, uh, separated between originary stuttering and acquired stuttering. And in the originary stuttering, we have the originary neurogenic non-syndromal stuttering. This has been named so far the idiopathic stuttering. It's the usual stuttering which starts in ch childhood without a detectable cause. And it's very common. Uh, the genetic, uh, uh, it has mainly genetic origin. The symptoms uh, at the start of words and phrases are uh, especially um, um, yeah, frequent and especially in complex phrases, and there are often phys physical concomitants. Um, so now, from now on, I only name it um, stuttering. However, I will explain you why we named it originary neurogenic non-syndromal stuttering. At first, because we have an originary neurogenic syndromal stuttering, which is very rare, but uh, it uh, occurs, for example, in syndromes like trisomy 21, in Down syndrome, you can, you, you can find it sometimes, but also in other symptoms. Uh, these this speech disfluencies, which occur in this stuttering, are often not typical for stuttering. Um, there is 
not a direct evidence for an efficacy of therapy of this kind of stuttering, but um, there are some cases known to me which, uh, which were effective. The originary neurogenic non-syndromal stuttering, here we need a treatment in particular in childhood. And then, to the contrary, we have the acquired stuttering. Uh, the acquired neurogenic stuttering is not so rare anymore because with the aging of the population, it occurs more often. It follows an organic or functional brain injury. For instance, after stroke or after brain bleeding, we find this kind of stuttering. And uh, the, the stutter typical disfluencies are independently of the complexity of the utterances, differently from the, um, yeah, uh, from the usual stuttering. And there are fewer physical concomitants. The therapy of the underlying disorder is of course uh, the main therapy and complementary speech therapy can performed if required. And then we have the very rare psychogenic stuttering. And let me say something to you uh, about this kind of stuttering, because many parents and many people and sometimes professionals believe that the usual stuttering is a psychogenic stuttering. Because parents often come and say, oh, my child started to stutter when we passed a burning car, for example, a car accident. But um, you need to know that uh, this simply psychogenic origin is not the origin. It's only a trigger. Any other trigger also could have caused uh, the stuttering. Um, but a real psychogenic stuttering uh, occurs after puberty, puberty and following a strong psychological trauma or psychiatric dis disorder. I had one patient, 60 years old, who was present uh, in the Balkan War when uh, his half uh, village has been murdered and uh, in, including his parents and siblings. And he started to stutter from this moment on very strongly. This is a psychogenic stuttering, but not that stuttering which occurs in childhood very early after, let's say, a, a, hound, a, a, a dog was barking. Okay, and here the treatment is a psychotherapy and a complementary speech therapy might be uh, necessary as well. Okay, so because the originary neurogenic stuttering, which arises during child childhood with no recognizable cause, is associated with structural and functional changes in the brain, we propose to change the attribution of the word neurogenic with respect to stuttering. This was our reason to call it neurogenic as well. In former times, only the acquired one was called neurogenic, but we, we cause this neurogenic originary stuttering. You can also say primary stuttering if you want. Okay. Um, because stuttering symptoms do not belong to the normal language development of a child, and because stutter typical disfluencies may be differentiated from normal speech disfluencies, which we have all, uh, we propose not to use the term developmental stuttering because it doesn't belong to normal development. Yeah? Okay. The originary neurogenic non syndromal stuttering, or I call it now only stuttering, is a central nervous speech and speech planning disorder which arises during childhood due to a genetic disposition. It comp comprises core symptoms with stutter typical disfluencies. Uh, what are stutter typical disfluencies? It are the uh, uh, 
repetitions of single syllables or monosyllabic words like let's say i i i i i i have yeah you know it all either one syllable or monosyllabic words or either prolongations my mother or either blocks blockages um, either silent or uh, yeah silent or filled pauses for example i have a block yeah or yeah the rain ton with a tension in the break between the two words okay and um, there are secondary symptoms with vegetative motor and emotional react reactions on the speech disfluency disorder which kind of uh, uh, secondary symptoms for example grimaces uh, face uh, uh, movements uh, extremities hand and, and leg movements um, irregularities in breathing red skin sweating and so on and of course negative emotional reactions uh, escape behavior people try to escape a, a special word they uh, order in a restaurant limonade instead of coca coca cola because it's too hard to speak for them for example they circumvent words they circumvent speech situations and yeah and often develop phobia social phobia which can be very difficult for them to yeah handle so i see some okay i see uh, <laughs> the chats but they are from Haldun, so everything is fine <laughs> everything is fine <laughs> everything is fine um so the original, the, the normal stuttering starts between two, two to six years of age in most cases, sometimes later. I already mentioned the prevalence, 1.4% children and less than 1% of, ad, uh, of adults. You may know from books, from textbooks, uh, that children have a prevalence of 5%, but this is not the truth. Often uh, people uh, or authors mix up incidence and prevalence. And stuttering has a much higher incidence, I will show you. So the sex distribution is in the initial phase, three to two males to one female. But later on, due to sex different recovery from stuttering, about five to one male to female. Okay, the incidence. Uh, so the new upcoming of the, uh, of the stuttering up to the fourth and fifth years is about 5%. And depending on the study, up to 11%. Um, but due to a high spontaneous recovery rate there is a much higher uh, uh, the incidence is much higher than the prevalence that means many children lose the stuttering get rid of the stuttering spontaneously and this is also the big danger um, often uh, pediatricians tell the parents who come to them and say my child is stuttering they tell them Oh, it doesn't matter. Wait, uh, it will disappear. And they are right for 70 to 80 percent of the children. However, for the remaining uh, 20 to 30 percent, it can be such a hard struggling uh, through all their life um, that you, I, I, I really want to sensitize you uh, to start really early with a treatment. Not everybody who stutters needs a treatment, but many people need it. Okay. So the recovery. Um, a stuttering is regarded permanent if the speech fluency 
is kept longer than 12 months. The recovery occurs mostly until puberty, very rarely in adulthood. Uh, its rate is highest in the first two years of stuttering, in particular during the first six to 12 months. Thereafter, the chance for recovery decreases drastically. Uh, mostly uh, uh, the stuttering which has not disappeared until the age of 12 years will hardly disappear later, only very rarely. There are ris uh, risk factors for the persistence of stuttering. Of course, one risk factor is to be male. Another risk factor is if stuttering persists longer than one year, uh, if there is persistent stuttering in the family, it's a, a, the strongest risk factor. Um, if the age of stuttering onset is late, later than four years, and if the symptoms increased in severe severity during the first year. But uh, an individual prognosis regarding the recovery cannot be made. Okay, what are stuttering symptoms? Um, we diagnose stuttering uh, by convention if at least 3% of the syllables uh, you speak show stutter typical disfluencies. I, sh I, I, I told you what stutter typical disfluency are, uh, disfluencies are. But we also uh, talk about stuttering independently from the stuttering frequency. That means also if there are less than 3% of stuttered syllables, um, if um, there are long-lasting stuttering events, long blocks, I press, uh, or if the emotional load by the stuttering and avoidance behavior is strong and other secondary symptoms such as strain in the stutter symptom or stutter associated uh, core move, movements are strong. Oh, I see a um, spelling error, but forgive me. Um, there is a thing like um, covert stuttering. Covert stuttering, is in particular, if the children are very clever, um, you, you see there is something strong with their uh, speaking, and they have many interjections such as um, um, and so on. They uh, um, correct themselves, they stop in the middle of a word or in the middle of a sentence and start again. And you say something is the matter with his or her speaking, but I can't say what it is exactly. So this is often covert stuttering, where the escape behavior is so strong that the, people, the, the, the children hide the stuttering. And you can uh, elicitate the stuttering in diagnostics. I show you how. So here I show you uh, on a German example how you call, uh, how you count the stuttering. For instance, if a person says "ich ich ich ich" or "ich ich ich", ich this is not uh, three or four syllables. Stuttered syllables is only one stuttered syllables, and uh, yeah, um, in the publication I mentioned at first, you can see there are some examples how to count it if you are unsure what is a stuttered syllable. So we need to separate uh, normal speech disfluencies, which occur in every person. Uh, in normally speaking, adults up to 10% of the syllables can show normal speech disfluencies, such as um, also or pauses or um, revisions of words and phrases. Here I show you some examples. This is a nice, no, it's not a nice program. Or children, children have it very frequently during their speech development, language development, in particular in times where they make a big progress in speech motor skills and in linguistic complexity of the sentences. 
let's say at the age of about three years, four years. This is also the time where stuttering arises in the most uh, cases, but stutter stuttering can also occur uh, for one word sentences, for example. So something like, mom, I have, I have, I have, I have, you, you know, all these children and they, uh, the, the difference uh, between this, this, uh, uh, this fluency and stuttering, uh, these repetitions is, they are cool words or phrases, uh, polysyllabic words and phrases, or broken words. Nobody has ever done that before either, and then they start again. So, for the first time worldwide, um, the trial of a deep brain stimulation in case of stuttering. So uh, we are, my colleague and I, I, I initiated it. I hope, I hope very much we will be um, successful and open this new kind of treatment opportunity to people like him. Okay, let's talk about the genetics of stuttering. The originary neurogenic new non-syndromal stuttering is highly heritable. Um, in a population, uh, 30, uh, 70 to 80 percent of the causes for stuttering are heritable. That does not mean you cannot say, oh, my, my stuttering in an indi individual case is uh, uh, 70 percent genetically caused, but for a population you can say that. So, uh, Molecular genetics has identified more than a dozen disposition loci for stuttering on several chromosomes. The difficulty is you need to replicate that. So if you found a, a chromosome, a, a gene locus, uh, where you find some association with stuttering, this has to be replicated and this is the difficulty. But uh, there's also a locus on chromosome 8, which has been identified only in non-stuttering persons. So it has to do with recovery and also, and seems to be a protective factor. Or uh, there has been um, there has been uh, a gene locus identified, which is only associated with the recovery in females and may explain why females recover much more than males. But uh, the, the research is going on. So what I want to say with that, the language input for a child is not involved in the primary causes of stuttering. We got our first knowledge from twin studies. For example, in Denmark, there are, is a big twin registry with more than um, 18,000 pairs of twins. Or there was a big twin study in Australia where um, people, uh, twins got also, uh, it was in a census, got also questions about their speaking and stuttering. And there were more than 200 um, stuttering twins identified and so the research could show that twins, uh, monozygotic twins have a high, um, how can, um, uh, not comorbidity, um, no, I forgot the word, coincidence, coincidence of stuttering. So if one uh, 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 twin stuttered, the probability for the other twin also to stutter was higher than 50%. And the same was the case for recovery. If one um, twin recovered from stuttering, there was also a very high uh, uh, probability for his sibling, to, to, for his twin also to recover. And this happened independently of the family shared environment. That means there were many twins which lived in different houses. Parents divorced, divorced and one twin lived with the one 
and the other one with the other uh, uh, parent. However, uh, the coincidence was the same as for if they would have lived together. This showed that not the family, not the so socialization is responsible for the cause of stuttering. And by counseling the parents, speculations about the potential cause role of the socialization of a child with respect to her stuttering have to be avoided by us physicians and by therapists. The parents shall be reassured that they are not responsible for the occurrence of their child's stuttering. That's very important. We know now that uh, stuttering is a polygenic disease with several gene loci of different effects involved and a genome environment interactions which we know not so well so far and a sex dependent threshold. Okay, so the stuttering is associated with predominantly genetically caused cerebral, morphological, and functional abnormalities compared with non-stuttering persons, in particular in circuits which are involved in speech, language, and auditory processes. Obviously, the production of speech fluency needs a continuous dynamic interaction between those auditory, somatosensory, and speech motor neuronal networks. Um, I show you one of the first experiments of my group. Um, here we let people, stuttering people and non-stuttering people, uh, uh, solve speech motor tasks and linguistic tasks. And we could show that all stuttering people, but no non-stuttering person, uh, activated strongly in the right hemisphere uh, in a region, Brodmann area 47, in a region which is nearly the opposite, uh, uh, the homolog, the right hemispheric homolog of the Broca's area. We, we have to know that the Broca's area and uh, other areas in the left frontal cortex uh, have structural lesions in stutterers. What does it mean? Uh, what you can see here is that this region is thinner, this cortical gray, this cortex is thinner in persons who stutter than in non-stuttering persons. And it is the more, it is the thinner, the more somebody stutters. There is a negative correlation. So this seems to be a primary reason. There is another primary reason. These are uh, uh, weak fibers. I will show it on the, on the next slide. And obviously, these uh, areas which show overactivations in stutterers compensate for the structural lesions on the left hemisphere. We know all the left hemisphere is our, our language uh, a dominant hemisphere. And uh, this region obviously um, compensates for the non-functioning or not well-functioning other side. We know this also from stroke. Uh, if people have a stroke and get aphasia or, so, or have some motor uh, deficits, uh, at first the homologous area on the, in the other hemisphere starts to be activated uh, compensatory. And we know that it is compensatory because it was the less activated, the more somebody stuttered. And uh, only soft stuttering was associated with strong activation here. Okay. So another uh, structural lesion happens in the white matter, in the white fibers. Uh, there is a reduction of directivity and density in the fibers below the left hemispheric sensory motor regions of face, larynx, and articulatory organs in stuttering adults and children. And the fibers belong predominantly to the arcuate fascicle 
which um, connects the auditory cortical areas, in particular the Wernicke area, with the frontal cortical areas, in particular the Broca's area, and the speech and, and the motor cortex, the cortex uh, also the speech motor cortex. So here we have um, weak fibers. Okay, we wanted to know what are the effects of a, of a good functioning, of a, a well-functioning stuttering treatment. And what you see here are the areas, the, the gray areas, where untreated stuttering people activate more in their brain than non-stuttering people. And you see, it's mainly, it happens mainly in the right hemisphere. You see all these gray patches in the right hemisphere. And after a successful fluency shaping therapy, you see much more activity compared with non-stuttering people, but now also in the left hemisphere, mainly even in the left hemisphere. So what does the treatment do? It shifts the activity from the right hemisphere to the left hemisphere, uh, where it has to be. And most interestingly, surrounding in the close vicinity of the fiber regions which are not, which have lesions. So it's also the same like in, in stroke. If the uh, function returns, for example, speech function after a, a stroke or motor function, the activity, the brain activity shifts back to the area where it has to be However, if there is tissue which cannot be repaired, for example, a scare or after bleeding, something which does not function, um, the, uh, the activity surrounds this area. Okay. Then we wanted to know what happens if we, what happens in recovery, in complete recovery. So for, for a couple of years, we were looking for adults who have recovered from stuttering spontaneously. I told you there are not many, however, there are some, and we found some, and compared their brains, structural and uh, functional, with the brains of people, who, of, of normal speaking people, and of people who um, stutter and who uh, underwent treatment. And the only region which is different from all uh, in, in the persons who recovered spontaneously from stuttering is now the left Brodmann area 47. That means an area in the left inferior frontal cortex close to the Broca's area. And we wanted to know what, what does this area do? And nowadays we do not any longer um, Oh, it has been published in two, 2018, sorry, I made a mistake. Um, we do not look any longer only on the locations, but we look on the, the connections between several locations, on the connectivity, the functional and stru structural connectivity in the brain, and um, it, on the, the networks are interesting. And we have seen that untreated stuttering has, is associated with a reduced audit, auditory motor coupling. It, uh, in particular, with posterior auditory um, association cortex, this region. What does it mean? So uh, you all know if we hear our own speech, um, delayed, with a delay, then we get disfluent. We cannot speak fluently any longer. It's called the Lee effect. But people who stutter have the, the opposite. If you uh, send to them, uh, let them hear their own speech with a little delay of about 50 to 200 milliseconds, there are some devices who, which do that, they, are, they get fluently. How does it happen? Um, that we also we found, but also other groups found 
a disturbed, a disturbed motor a speech uh, uh, auditory motor coupling uh, because of the, the the weak fiber tracts I, I showed you. That means um, you, uh, uh, stutterers cannot merge uh, the hearing of their own speak speech during speech planning and speech execution. We do it all together. I do it at the moment. I hear my own speech. I plan my next uh, uh, sentences uh, in in the. Uh, left inferior frontal cortex, and I execute speech motor movements. And stutterers cannot merge their own speech, uh, hear speech very well in the speech motor plan. They are much more dependent, there is an over-reliance on somatosensory feedback. After a successful treatment, uh, the, the, this over-reliance from the somatosensory feedback is decreased and the auditory motor mapping is improved by an increased functional connectivity between the articulatory motor cortex and the anterior superior uh, frontal uh, uh, um, um, uh, temporal gyrus here, this region. However, what happens in the people who get recovered from stuttering? What does this BA47 do? It uncouples, it uh, uh, dysfunctional speech motor uh, 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 parts of the speech networks from the functioning. Um, it does a functional isolation from non-functional uh, parts of the networks, for example, from the cerebellum. This is what makes long-term recovery possible. Okay, so now we leave the brain. Was it too hard? Are you still awake all? Yes, <laughs> of oh, good. course. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one word about the comorbidities of stuttering. It is always mentioned so often in the literature that children who stutter have a higher degree or to a higher uh, uh, extent uh, uh, developmental language disorders, in particular phonological disorders. I tell you, what we found was, um, we, we, we checked all the available studies. Uh, phonological, semantic lexical, grammar abilities, do not seem to play a major role for children at kindergarten ages for the occurrence and persistence of stuttering. If a superiority or inferiority of stuttering compared with non-stuttering children with respect to their language um, um, capabilities and communicative abilities have been found, the deviations were small in both directions. Sometimes stuttering children were better than non-stuttering children and sometimes they were worse. Okay, we did not find strong evidence for a higher degree of developmental language disorders. We found uh, strong uh, uh, evidence for social anxiety, which occurs to a higher uh, extent. There was questionably a slightly higher coincidence with learning disability and dyslexia, but no strong evidence. Attention deficit disorder the same. Um, less stuttering in, in children with deafness or profound hearing, hearing loss has been described, but these are soft data. We do not know how is the uh, prevalence of stuttering nowadays when cochlear implants and high power hearing aids are available to the children. There is no study on that. All the comorbidities except the social anxiety are questionable. I leave this out stuttering in, out stuttering in multilingualism, otherwise we get not ready. Um, the screening for stuttering, there are screenings. Um, we also, my group has developed a screening and we checked the screenings for who can screen children for stuttering. We checked questionnaires for parents, did not function. We checked questionnaires for the children themselves, did not function. Uh, 
we checked um, questionnaires for nurse, nursery nurses, did not function. The only questionnaire and, and test we developed uh, screening was for physicians. Uh, where physicians, pediatricians, for example, in normally uh, in, in regular um, um, uh, examinations, ask the parents for some stuttering symptoms and elicited speech or, or even stuttering in the children. It is downloadable from a website. I didn't find a link, but I can include it in the presentation. There are several at risk screenings, for example, the screening list for stuttering. If somebody has stuttering relatives, it can be applied. So what does our uh, um, diagnostic uh, aims on? We want to see, uh, to, to assess the core symptoms of stuttering and the accompanying behaviors. And of course, also the um, the subject, subjective perspectives of the patient, the consequences for the everyday life and health-related quality of life, according to the uh, ICF model. Uh, for an objective assessment of the audible and visible stuttering symptoms, we need to have uh, to record representative speech samples of at least 300 syllables. You can do it by audio recordings or by audio video recordings. To, to uh, rate only the stuttering and say somebody has a severe or a mild stuttering is not enough. For an objective diagnostics and in particular for treatment control, you need to have uh, the audio recordings of at least 300 syllables. From them, you calculate the um, frequency of stuttering, the percent um, stuttered syllables, and the best would be also the longest stuttering events. You have seen long stuttering events in the, in the movie I showed you from the stuttering the stutterer. And this and the accompanying accompanying behavior needs to be assessed for stuttering. Um, okay, there are several tools, international tools, the Stuttering Severity Instrument, SSI 4 now, is applicable for all groups, age groups, and for children in, in particular, the test of childhood stuttering is a well-validated tool. Both tools are very useful. And for the, um, yeah, for the qu health related quality of life, there are the OASIS tools internationally available, the overall assessment of the speaker's experience with stuttering by Yaros and Kisal. And it has been translated in many languages. I'm sure it will be also available in Turkey. Uh, well, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but uh, I, we can find it out. Um, Okay, if there is a suspicion of an additional psychic disorder, the patients need to undergo a psychological or psychiatric diagnostics, for example, for social anxiety. So, as a global rating of the stuttering severity shall not be used as the only measure of the treatment effect if they are done by the therapist herself. So this is not evidence-based medicine. If a therapist says, oh, the patient feels better, or he or she does not stutter so much anymore, or uh, she uh, performs well during treatment, but unfortunately she cannot uh, use it in, or transfer it to everyday life, it is the task of the therapist to make the patient transferring it uh, to the everyday life. So what can we do if we have the suspicion of a covert stuttering? Then uh, uh, during the examination, the stuttering shall be provoked by communicative stressors, like you say to the child, oh, tell me, tell me a movie or tell me this and this story. And then you impel the patient to a higher speech rate uh, and 
uh, interrupt him or her of frequently and assess potential psychic load by the uh, and uh, then you then people often start to stutter okay so now we want to talk about treatment of stuttering what is what does really work um, we wanted to find it out in our systematic review and uh, we wanted we only included studies um, which informs about the treatment which aimed at reduction of stuttering the sample size oh there is an is a mistake was at least 12 not 122 but 12 persons effect sizes had to be rep uh, uh, reported or calculable so and uh, at least two time measurements repeated measures before and after treatment and a follow up of at least 3 months should be available after the end of the treatment a pre post treatment assessment alone was insufficient so we found 43 studies in our systematic review and we uh, classified the quality of the studies according to the levels of ex uh, evidence uh, according to oxford center for evidence based medicine and for every of the 43 studies we made such a table where we described very uh, 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 exactly the the sample the inclusion criteria exclusion criteria the intervention and so on and made a methodological evaluation of the study okay so what did we find out systematic reviews and meta analysis have uh, revealed effective treatment components uh, these are med methods for adolescents and adults which train initially slowed speaking intensively so what does it mean i i go forward to this uh, uh, slide uh, one of the methods which do this is the so-called global speech restructuring here for instance we have in, in germany the so-called Kassel stuttering uh, treatment uh, as a fluency shaping treatment. This is a behavioral treatment approach uh, where a complete new way of speaking is learned that does not allow or should not allow stuttering typi typical disfluency to arise. The, uh, the patients sit in front of a computer and uh, learn to to uh, reduce the speech of speech uh, of speaking to about two seconds per syllable to make soft voice onsets to have a certain manner of breathing to speak rhythmically and it sounds about this way i have been this and so on and they do this a week long every day for several hours and overlearn their normal speech pattern if this functions well they get quicker and quicker and during the past week this is an intensive treatment over two weeks they learn to get more and more speech naturally i play some examples for you then you know what i mean there is a high the strongest evidence worldwide for this kind of treatment the fluency shaping treatment or global speech restructuring so here you listen to a patient before treatment <laughs> So you hear that he has a lot of repetitions. This is in the middle of the treatment after one week. So einem neuerlichen Besuch der FDP Landa Wunan. You hear it is quite unnatural, but he gets he gets through. He, uh, he is fluent in a way, but nobody wants to hear 
a speech like that. I, speak, I, I show you another patient who has a lot of blocks. Qualität So as you hear, he didn't uh, finish his first word so far. And this is the same patient after the therapy, after two weeks of treatment. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. I can't show it. Yes, here. Qualitätssicherung der Kasseler Stottertherapie. In einem neuerlichen Besuch der FDP-Landtagsfraktion an der Universität die Gesamthochschule Kassel. Okay, you uh, hear that he is not completely fluent, but he is fully able to uh, function in his everyday life to get rid of all this social load. And yeah, this is fluency shaping therapy. Let's go back to the uh, to the treatment components which work. So I told you, train initially slowed speaking intensively, prolonged speaking, soft vocalizations, rhythmic speaking, breath control and changes of attitude for speaking practice. Then a, spe a, a, a therapy which includes exercises in a group or in front of groups, because this is difficult for people with stutters to practice the transfer in everyday situations. I tell you how it is done, for example, in the Kassel stuttering therapy. From the first moment on, before the treatment and in the treatment course, people have to speak in four speaking situations. One is speak, uh, to speaking in monologues, monologues. The other one is to talk with the therapist. The third one is to talk to unknown people, to passerbys on the street, they have to ask for the way or they have to go to the bakery and ask for and, and buy something. And the most difficult, to make telephone calls with unknown people, to call in a hotel and ask for prices and rooms and so on. And this is full stress for people who stutter and they train this in the therapy. They also have to include self-evaluation and self-management in program steps. For example, how, do, how to desensitize, how to um, get rid of the fear, how to perform in, in examination situations. Then to pursue speech naturalness, of course, and to include maintenance programs. As I showed you with the brain, uh, um, uh, in the, in the brain uh, um, research, the people didn't get their speech fully automated, that they had more um, activity after a successful uh, therapy because they do not really automize that. They have to practice what they acquired, what they acquired. Okay, let's go further. I nearly, I'm nearly ready. Give me 10 more minutes and then I'm ready. Yeah. Okay, the treatment aims for stut of stuttering are the reduction of stuttering symptoms, not only of the fear, but also of course of the stuttering symptoms and the reduction of the accompanying symptoms, the improvement of social participation, life, life activity and quality of life. Um, sometimes people talk about non-avoidance treatment but the, the effective treatment, one effective treatment I show you later is stuttering modification, uh, uh, which aims on, I, I, I show you. Um, so stuttering modification is also a bit or to some extent uh, effective. Uh, here, this is a local speech restructuring. That means it manipulates and corrects only the occurring stuttering ev events um, with a speech te technique. Fluent speech paths remain unprocessed. 
for example, people learn to uh, pull out of blocks. For, for example, I pull out. Yeah, I, I started again with breathing and then I came out of this block. And in addition, um, uh, exercises for desensitations are done for, uh, uh, to speech and to stuttering are carried out with the aim of reducing the psychosocial burden of stuttering. And there was one uh, kind of treatment which was called uh, non-avoidance, but not only the non-avoidance of stuttering is trained, but also to come out of the blocks and so. Um, there was a weak proof, proof of effectiveness. There were three high quality studies. So we, our group made an open recommendation. The procedures can be used for stuttering of all ages. Okay, let's go back. Um, um, if uh, so the treatment results are to be recorded by follow-up examinations. Again, with uh, syllables, uh, stuttered syllables and all the other um, diagnostic tools I showed you. If a treatment has been used for three months with at least one session a week and no significant can, can changes in one of the targets of the treatment, are visible, the treatment procedure had to be, has to be revised. You need to change your treatment method. Not two years of treatment with no effect. Yes, then you miss the valuable time for getting the children fluent. Okay, intensive treatment seems to be more effective than extensive one and group Treatment in for, for some treatments seems to be more effective than a single treatment, but only for some treatment kinds, I show you. Um, for children, the stuttering recovery should be aimed for at kindergarten age. Even if a complete recovery cannot be guaranteed, uh, preschool children have the best chances to get rid of stuttering. Uh, later on, it will be get more difficult. So this is the aim, to get them rid of stuttering before school starts. When do, should you start with treatment? Um, stuttering children, so we, we, we are aware of the high rate of spontaneous recovery, 70 to 80 percent, and we do not want to treat all the children who would have been recovered by themselves. Therefore, we recommended, based on studies, that uh, preschool children uh, should be observed six to 12 months after the onset of stuttering, not after the first presentation. And um, if the stuttering does not disappear or gets better, then they should undergo treatment. However, the treatment should be started immediately um, if there are risk factors for persistent stuttering, for example, a, a stuttering relative, or if the core symptoms of a child have long lasting symptoms, like you have seen in a movie with a loss of control or a strenuous behavior, if the symptoms are perceived by parents or the child as stressful and lead to suffering and avoidance behavior. One very uh, important message is um, if a child seems to have a developmental language disorder, this should not lead to a postponement of an indicated stuttering therapy. If necessary, do, treat, do two uh, treatments at once. Uh, in Germany, we are able to prescribe two simultaneously running treatments one for stuttering and one for development language disorder. So you, you do not miss the time. Of course, for comorbidities, such as um, social anxiety uh, or depression, you need, of course, uh, to decide what is more important for the patient. Uh, at first, 
to work on stuttering, to have a stuttering therapy, or at first to have a psychotherapy. Uh, there are good studies by Menzies and uh, colleagues who, sh who showed that in case of social anxiety, a sole uh, uh, psychotherapy is necessary, uh, 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 but does not reduce the stuttering to uh, to a sufficient degree, and vice versa, uh, sole stuttering treatment is not able to uh, uh, treat um, sufficiently the anxiety disorder. So people need both, but you need to decide as a physician or as a, a therapist what to do first. <laughs> I, I always come into this. So I talked about global speech restructuring and stuttering modification, which is also called local speech restructuring. This is a, and a combination of speech restructuring and stuttering modification is functioning as well. Okay, for children in the, um, for preschool children, uh, the most effective uh, uh, program which and the best validated uh, uh, therapy is the LITCOM treatment. Uh, here, uh, this therapy based, is based on the principle of operant learn learning, uh, which is carried out with the constant involvement of parents. In phase one, the parents are educated as being a co-therapist. They learn to speak with the child on a, uh, on a um, simple linguistic level and do structured games every day with the child and um, enhance fluent speech positively. They say, oh, you spoke uh, very smoothly this sentence. And sometimes uh, they gently correct stuttering events. They say, oh, there was a little bumpy uh, uh, word, but it doesn't matter. And so they uh, give positive uh, feedback about five times and one time uh, they correct the child and so they enhance the fluent speech of the child and it functions well. And if this functions during uh, struct structured games, they come into phase two and do it in everyday life for a maintenance phase. There's a strong evidence and a strong recommendation that this ought to be used in ch children from three to six years. There is only one uh, a good study for an indirect method. Uh, it is named the Dutch uh, Restart DCM method. Here, the parents are instructed to adapt their language requirements to the child's cap capacities under which uh, the child's fluency of of speech should increase. For example, they slow down their own speech. Uh, they uh, simplify their speech in a lingu uh, on a linguistic level. They, they are, uh, react calm to stuttering. They uh, don't overwhelm their child with questions and so on. However, the, uh, there are some criticisms on this methods and as I told you there is only one well studied. Okay so what do we have? We have the LITCOM treatment and this uh, indirect treatment and also stuttering uh, modification for children for uh, preschool children. Here are the studies. I, you will get them with my presentation. This is the indirect method. Uh, the, um, what we should not do is an extensive unspe unspecific treatment one session per week speaking reading breathing practices by an SP, uh, slp logopedist who uh, in, in a practice or school setting who does not apply one of the study uh, of the of the treatments i mentioned or where the parents do not recognize any concept this is does, does, this does not help. For children at school age, uh, the stuttering, uh, the, the speech restructuring treatment, the fluency shaping is well uh, validated now. 
or a combination of speech restructuring and stuttering modification. Stuttering modification is beneficial as well. And for adults and adolescents, uh, the speech restructuring, the stuttering modification and the combination is available. Here are the studies. What does not help are pharmacological agents. There were many studies about that. There is no one uh, um, medication which really helps and can be recommended. Okay, therapeutic methods not to be used are methods without measures of everyday transfer and generalization to the practice. Method with, without measures for fallback processing. If a patient falls back, then the, if the pa pa uh, therapist then say, oh, it's your fault. Uh, you should have um, practiced more also. Uh, you need to have a strategy for fallback processing. Procedures that show short-term success but lack long-term follow-up and maintenance programs should not be used. Procedures which based solely on changes in breathing or rel relaxation techniques are not useful. We have shown this in studies. Procedures this is that assign blame for causing stuttering or po possible relapses to the affected person or the family. And um, procedures that promise a cure and do not describe the treatment goals and procedure in a comprehensible way are to be considered dubious and should not and should therefore also be rejected. Psychotherapy, I mentioned it already, self-help group may help. There is no strong evidence for it, but they may be helpful. There are some devices, apps and software in stuttering treatment. Uh, the one device I, I told you is for instance, um, a, a device like a hearing aid uh, with, uh, where the own speech is uh, played back to the patient with a delayed or frequent or changed frequency. It can eliminate stuttering during the period of their use but cannot be recommended as a routine treatment. Software which improves speech fluencies should be used only with the setting of recommended stuttering therapies and under the supervision of a therapist. Speech signal or electromyography mediated biofeedback methods could be considered as a, com as a therapeutic component, as I showed you for the um, fluency shaping. Okay, one single uh, um, slide for cluttering. We have not much evidence for cluttering. Do you know how cluttering sounds? It's too fast speaking or with a fast or irregular speed, irregular vocalizations, collapsing or omitting syllables, abnormalities of pauses, speech rhythm and syllable pronunciation, disfluencies which are non-typical for stuttering and thus reduced speech intelligibility. I uh, speak, uh, I, I play one German example for you, but I tell you, even I as a German cannot understand what this person speaks. Let me see how to get it played. Wenn halt meine Aufgabe ist, um Text zu lesen und durchzuarbeiten, dann schlägt es eigentlich mehr so an Oberstufen oder an, äh, doch allgemein, also an Mittelstufe Oberstufe, nicht jetzt in der Grundschule, also ganz genau an die Amerika, an die Gymnasialzeit. Da habe ich gemerkt, ich muss ein Fenster anrollen, wollten, man irgendwie langsamer war. Ne? Okay, this is cluttering. Uh, <laughs> Neuroimaging uh, neuro experiments uh, have also shown cerebral alterations of speech processings uh, compared with uh, both with normally fluent persons and with stuttering so we give they give evidence that uh, there are disturbances of speech motor planning and speech related feed forward mechanisms so that means that cluttering has to be regarded an own pathogenetic en entity and not a norm variant and not a variant of stuttering. Hmm. There are few, only few uh, treatment stu uh, studies on cluttering. <coughs> they prove 
the uh, therapeutic su success, especially of fluency shaping strategies, which we know from stuttering therapy. This needs to be cluttering, not stuttering. Okay, so here we have the drafting committee of the uh, um, of our guideline. Me, two psychologists. Uh, four uh, speech language pathologists, one neurologist, this is our group. And I say thank you for your attention with some famous stutterers, Charles Darwin and his uh, grandfather, Erasmus Darwin. Here you have the, uh, uh, the genetic component. <laughs> Winston Churchill, um, I was in his uh, uh, castle and all the people who worked there, they said, no, he never stuttered. Of course not. And uh, this is Demosthenes, the, the, the person with the stone in the mouth who spoke uh, uh, against uh, uh, the sea. And here we have Bruce Willis and there's also uh, Marilyn Monroe who speak completely fluently if they speak their roles. Uh, always, if, if stuttering people speak poems, roles, speak uh, to their uh, pet, or to a baby, they are fluent because stuttering is associated with high communicative stress. But um, Bruce Willis, he always says he feels well and not stuttering if he has his uh, movie <laughs> role. Okay, so that's what I wanted to tell you. And now I can stop this presentation and I see a lot of chats. Shall I answer your questions? Ah, thank you very much, dear Katrin. Uh, <laughs> it was an excellent presentation. And I think this was the uh, most evidence-based uh, presentation on stuttering that I have uh, ever listened. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. And the audience, uh, the audience is also happy uh, to uh, listen to you as far as I understand from the questions and from the chat. I try to uh, put them in an order to be able to discuss them with you, but uh, it seems that we have more than 20 questions now, so I will try to cover nearly all of them, okay? So I, yeah. I can feel that you are tired because, because you have been speaking for like more than uh, seven to five minutes now. So thank you very much for this excellent presentation. Thank you. So let's begin from the basics. and. How can we differentiate between stuttering and word finding difficulty? Yeah, um, you can make, if possible, some um, um, vocabulary tests. And um, uh, there are some, uh, what I told you, that uh, stuttering occurs mostly uh, in the beginning of a phrase or a sentence and mostly in complex, uh, okay, I, I have to admit that also word finding difficulties occur in complex uh, uh, linguistic uh, um, things. However, if you look for the, for the symptoms, monosyllabic repetitions or monosyllabic words and the prolongations and the ams and so on, and you stress the people a little bit and you see whether uh, the, the, the typical symptoms come across, then you can uh, um, separated. Yeah. Uh, when we think about normal disfluency and uh, regarding normal disfluency, is there a direct therapy or uh, some kind of guidance that we can recommend for the family? Because normal disfluencies are not uh, yeah, uh, a disease, therefore they are called normal, uh, uh, not di directly. What I could, uh, because uh, in childhood, it's a phase which is overcome after a while. And if adults or adolescents have a lot of disfluencies so that it is disturbing, then they rather need a kind of rhetoric training uh, than a, tra a treatment. And slowing the rate of speech is easily taught to children. However, when we want to generalize this to prolonged speech, to real life situations, it's always challenging. And how, how do you achieve to generalize uh, the speech in children? What's your recommendation? 
um, you mean to generalize fluent speech? Um, probably, um, yeah, uh, I have uh, shown you uh, two techniques. Uh, the, the global speech restructuring, um, uh, if they get fluent in the uh, in front of the computer for the children, these are computer games uh, where they they uh, align their syllables into little pictures and so on. And after a while, they get quicker and quicker. And then you try uh, to uh, their generalization is uh, practiced from the first beginning on. Uh, in the litcomp treatment, the generalization happens. Uh, by transition from phase one, from the structured game phase to the uh, everyday life phase, where the children get in, uh, get the positive rewards, the, uh, the positive reinforcement from the parent during everyday situation when a mother says to the child, oh, this was nicely fluent, or oh, this was a little bit bumpy, but doesn't matter something like that. This helps generalization. And what I told you, this uh, uh, transfer by practicing at first speaking in front of a mirror, speaking in front of a group, speaking in front of the baker where you go, go and sell some bread also, speaking in front of strangers, speaking on the telephone. This also helps to generalize also for children, speaking to peers in games. Um, how should we manage a child if he or she is not aware of uh, his or her stuttering? Haha, <laughs> yeah, this was a, a question, a long-standing question. Should I tell a child or my child if she or he Stutters, or do I worsen the situation? Uh, and uh, often parents did not uh, uh, want that the word stuttering is mentioned in front of their child, in the presence of their child. Nowadays, it's like with cancer, it has been left. This concept has been completely left. Um, the children should know that they stutter, but it's the manner how you explain it to them. Um, that's what I taught about the litcom. You say, oh, yes, you have these bumpy moments, but you are a wonderful uh, child, my wonderful son. You, you need to give the child uh, the trust in, uh, your, in the social embedding and so on. And then you can start to treat. You can start much better to treat a child if she or he knows that he is stuttering than if not. Okay. And how should we manage a child, uh, a patient, if uh, she or he has a stuttering parent, if, if she, he is living in a stuttering environment in a family? It doesn't matter because um, stuttering is not a learned behavior. That's what I wanted to tell you. Uh, it is either um, inherited or it is, it is not learned. Uh, the, the, head of this uh, or the, the inventor of this uh, Kassel stutter uh, uh, treatment, he is a stutterer by himself. And uh, he told me um, when he got a baby, oh, what a pity. Now I start to stutter again. Now he, she, now he is eight months old and he looks so uh, strange to me. And I have the feeling that he now uh, uh, notices that I stutter. I tell you, it doesn't matter anything. Uh, 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 the stutter will not be learned. Okay. And Katrin, just to give you uh, a break, uh, I want to mention to all of our attendees that we have a real international uh, follower list here, uh, beginning from Finland to Saudi Arabia, from Russia to Venezuela. So, wow. <laughs> so you have a very uh, important I see if list. Matthias Weikert, somebody from Germany. Hello, Matti. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's here as well. 
<laughs> okay. And actually, you have already mentioned this, but uh, this is still a question, so I will ask it to you. Uh, when when do you start treatment at preschool children? Um, yeah, as I told you, uh, you can wait at least, um, or you can uh, wait at maximum six to 12 months. There was a study which compared children who waited six months with those who waited 12 months. And 12 months was still possible, but you should not wait longer. Uh, another thing is that you do not need to treat every stuttering. Um, if people do not suffer from stuttering, you do not need to treat them. If a child does not suffer, you do not need to treat him or her. Yeah? Okay. And one of our colleagues asked about the treatment plan. Uh, he says that he usually uses the fluency shaping, but mm -hmm. sometimes the patients refuse to do, to do this. They usually say, I will not slow down my speech. And what should we do in such cases? Yeah. Uh, to tell him or her that this slowing down is only the first beginning. Uh, as I have shown you in my examples, if you really practice this, if you are strict with practicing, practicing it, you will be able to speak fluently after two weeks, three weeks, but you need to work really hard. If this is not uh, accepted by the person, then you can uh, use the um, stuttering modification where you at least learn to do the pullouts and to desensitize against the stuttering, to um, lose the fear, to do pseudo stuttering, to do voluntary stuttering um, in front of others or in front of a mirror to uh, lose the fear. Yeah, uh, this is another good treatment. And at least um, the, this, um, these devices, um, how to, I, I, I'm looking for the word. Um, I will tell you how the devices are called. Uh, DAF, Delayed late, late or feedback, order feedback. Or yeah. uh, frequency altered feedback devices. Um, they are also opportunities. But most of people who use them leave them. There are also apps where you can uh, have this uh, altered feedback, but most of the people are not willing to use it forever. Okay. So there is one question about the second language. Uh, could it be possible to explain different function of stuttering in second language by neuroimaging? Okay. Or should we consider other factors like language factors in such a condition? Yeah. There were, there is a bunch of studies. Um, and I, I tell you, I am um, last, or no, two years ago, I was the guest editor, editor in the a journal of Fluency Disorders, where I'm associate editor for a special issue on new neuroimaging findings and stuttering, where we reviewed all the available uh, knowledge from, uh, from uh, neuroimaging. And um, there are not many studies, if at if studies at all, to my knowledge, about multilinguistic uh, persons, because this is one uh, variable more, yeah, one uh, variable condition more. However, um, what is known um, is for treatment or for, for, for stuttering, if somebody stutters in one language and speaks less in another language and has a different um, frequency of stuttering in the other language, if he would switch the language to the other language, he would stutter after a while as in the first language. And therefore, uh, you need to treat only in one language. And in the, what I wanted to say to, about the uh, neuroimaging studies, uh, there were a lot of linguistic tasks and speech motor tasks. And what came out was that the speech motor problem is the 
most st striking problem to make a a good speech motor plan and sp uh, motor execution. Linguistic factors uh, uh, play a less important role. Okay, you you are talking like for one and a half hour now, oh, but uh, it's it's uh, it's it's a privilege to listen to you for such a long time. But uh, I think some of our friends are still requesting some take home pill messages. Because the, because the question is like that. What is your way to treat young children with stuttering? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I, I, I tell you some take home messages to make yeah. it short. At first, uh, you should know uh, the, the, the effective treatment, treatments to counsel your patient and to, make, to let them make a choice, an informed choice. Second, you should not delay uh, the treatment start too long by uh, uh, pointing to the recovery. You, you never know whether a child recovers or not. Not more than, not longer than one year. Third, um, you should make an objective assessment, also a, a, a treatment monitoring. Fourth, if I would have a child at uh, age three to six years, I would start with the Litcomb treatment. If the Litcomb doesn't function, I would try, depending on the availability, either with a, a speech fluent, uh, with, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, speech fluency, also fluency shaping treatment, or a stutter modification treatment, or indirect treatment, according to this. Uh, DCM uh, restart plan. That's what I would do with a young child. Okay, thank you. Oh, I uh, forgot to, to mention one um, one point. It has been proven. I, I just work on a, an article about that. That online treatment, that uh, uh, video treatment, in adults and adolescents, and to a certain degree also in children, is as effective as face-to-face -face treatment. There is a big, big sample from the stuttering therapy, uh, which has been now treated uh, online and it functions as well as face-to-face. -face. It's, it's a very it's important. In, in, in COVID-19 times to do that. It's, it's, it's a very important uh, information uh, during this pandemic period because Lots of our patients requested our help through telemedicine uh, because they couldn't reach us during the uh, high season of the pandemic. And it is still sometimes needed because of their comorbidities uh, to be able to make therapies online. So it's yeah. nice to know this as well. Okay, we have- Publications on the way. Yeah, <laughs> we, have a few, we have a few more questions, then we will uh, finish this uh, beautiful meeting. One of them is, if we have a patient with long term of uh, stuttering, like uh, a case of 17 years of uh, old, a female lady, a female young lady of 17 years old with a severe stuttering for more than 13 years, mm -hmm. and, and she had no therapy response, she had been uh, to therapies for a long period of time, how could we approach her? Okay. Did she really have a good fluency shaping therapy? So uh, what, what we could offer, um, I, I see some of my uh, Egypt colleagues, uh, I, I gave one uh, a workshop in uh, Cairo at uh -huh. the Egypt University and I see some of my colleagues from there uh, where we already discussed it, this and I have, we have shown uh, examples, uh, you can ask the people from the Kassel Stuttering Therapy, which also do uh, uh, treatment in, in other languages, in English, in maybe even in Turkish, in, in Arab, uh, to do it online. Try it, uh, try it again, try it with this therapy. If it does not function, wait for our uh, results in the deep brain stimulation patient. Maybe we find a way. 
actually what I was trying to do was to uh, take this question uh, to the other one. I mean, to combine them with brain stimulation. So <laughs> this, this, this was my, my question. When you talk okay. about deep, deep brain stimulation, and uh, which, which areas are focused, which areas are addressed for stimulation? Honestly, because we will be the first who do that, I will not, <laughs> I will not tell it uh, so far, because we are unsure by ourselves, we are in big discussion about uh, the, uh, the target areas. We have two or three um, favorites, but I promise you, if it functions, I will tell you uh, immediately. And we will publish it immediately. Actually, you but can easily. Uh, the danger is very high that we are completely successless. Yeah. Actually, you can see uh, how qualified the questions are. Oh, yeah. they are very qualified. <laughs> um, okay. And uh, uh, what I wanted to say is um, there is a new, a brand new publication which came out, uh, it has just been published in the Journal of Fluency Disorders some weeks ago, a new uh, systematic review about effective uh, efficacy of uh, stuttering treatment. And there, there is shown that stuttering modification does not play a role because of the lack of high quality studies that fluency shaping is the most uh, promising um, uh, treatment. And there are two other kinds of treatment. One is um, local current stimulation or transcranial uh, mm -hmm. magnetic stimulation is not uh, that uh, promising. Then it has been thought the same is the case for psychotherapy. Thank you. Okay, uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, as I told you at the beginning of the session, uh, Katrin has a study spectrum of a very, a very large uh, study spectrum. So she promised me to make uh, many more webinars with us. Ah, so. many. <laughs> I, I, I promised you one or two more. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So my last question uh, is also from a colleague, from a listener. They are asking uh, about, is there any evidence for singing as a treatment oh. for stuttering? Okay. So okay. I, I will, I will, uh, I will uh, merge with, combine with uh, professional voice here, okay? Do we have any uh, evidence-based studies about singing uh, and stuttering? Yeah, okay. Um, I love this question because um, I, I just some years ago wrote something about it because it's well known that uh, stuttering people are completely fluent if they sing or if they speak in chorus. Um, and because uh, the areas in the brain which are responsible for these functions are a little bit different from uh, the speech fluency generating um, um, areas. And or it, it seems so. And, uh, in our journal for teachers, which every teacher in the, in the country gets, somebody um, advised, the teacher advised to all the teachers, because stutterers are fluent if they sing, to do the examinations uh, while singing. Let the children sing during examinations. And I, I, I wrote, a short article against it and for okay what a great idea let a 15 year old boy sing in front of his whole class and uh, teaches his uh, mathematics examination <laughs> completely weird it's not a therapy it will be over if he stops singing so <laughs> okay Dear Katrin, I would like to thank you very much uh, on behalf of all of the all of the listeners, attendees, and all, all of the friends that will uh, that will be seeing this presentation online later. Thank you very much. You have uh, I know that you have a small health problem. You have difficulties even in seeing patients, but you have reserved that precious time of yours to us for nearly two hours. 
So I would like to thank you very much. And I really appreciate your being with us. And I leave the last words to you. Thank my, my you. Pleasure. My pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you all for your uh, nice attention. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. The same to you.